Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, m and Bank, Customers Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns, Terra CRG. Additional support is made possible by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, Colliers International NYC, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Eastern Union Funding, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hersha Hospitality, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and these friends. Crowdfunding. EB-5, what, what, what are these terms? They've come around the world. They, they're involved in real estate financing. What is it? Who are they? What do they finance? What, what are they good for? So today I've assembled this group of business leaders who are going to teach us everything you want to know about the evolution of crowdfunding and EB-5 financing. From Florida, Nick Mastriani, who is the President and CEO of the U.S. Immigration Fund. From New Jersey, Paul Baumgarten, who is with the regional centers. From New York City, John Shannon, who is the managing director at HFZ Capital. Also from New York City, S. Lawrence Davis, a.k.a. Larry Davis, <laughs> who is the president and CEO of Sherwood Property. And last but not least, William Skelly, who is the founder, CEO, and chairman of iFunding. So, as we say, we don't play inside baseball. What is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding has been around forever. Actually, a lot of people don't know the Statue of Liberty was crowdfunded, with people putting in small amounts of money to pay for the Statue of Liberty. Uh, to uh, some older guys who have been in the business for a while, like yourself, it's uh, an easier way I to I didn't say I was old. <laughs> It's an easier way to use technology and leverage the technology online to syndicate deals. We're simply a technology platform matching tens of thousands of uh, investors, all accredited investors across the United States, with sponsors, operating partners like Paul, who's used crowdfunding now three or four times from us, uh, with uh, people looking to invest. I will say the two of you are the EB-5 specialists. So I'll ask Nick, explain EB-5. Well, Michael, EB-5 is a program that's been around since 1990. And what it is, is it's an immigration and investment program. So it allows non-U.S. residents to invest in uh, U.S. projects that create American jobs. So people in, in countries like China, you know, South America, anywhere outside of the U.S. can make an investment either directly into a project, which is called a direct investment, or they, they can make a pooled investment in a regional, regional center-sponsored program, which is what we do. And what happens is we'll, we'll put together a, a mezzanine loan for a, for a particular project, may require 200 investors, and we'll go out with this pooled investment, and we'll, uh, and we'll do roadshows you know, to aggregate investors to fill this fund up and make that loan to the developers. And in exchange for their investment, they get the, they get the right to file a form with the U.S. government that gets them temporary citizenship, a temporary green card. So they, they get temporary citizenship. So l l let me understand. Let's say John, okay, lived in... Uh, 
Israel even, okay, or China or South America. And he wanted to come to America, wants to get a visa. If he gave uh, an EB-5 regional center, being one of you over there, a half a million dollars, when can he come to, to America? And what are the, the rules and ramifications? So John would have to file what's known as an I-526 petition, which is an application uh, for citizenship. It takes about 14 months to get approved, adjudicated. Once that gets approved, he would be issued um, a, an approval letter, and then he could take that letter to the U.S. consulate in whatever country he's in. So he couldn't use it initially to come here. He Absolutely. has to have the letter, has to be approved first before he can get that, That's correct. When do you use crowdfunding? We've used crowd in, in really opportunistic situations where we have a short period of time to close on a, on a real estate asset. So we've used it to acquire land, existing income producing buildings with the idea that in a short period of time, within six months, we'd replace the crowdfunding with more traditional finance. Now, why do you use crowdfunding? Is it, is it quicker? Is it less expensive uh, than traditional finance? Well, in William's or, case, or two reasons, quick and certainty of close. Um, he funded uh, one of our projects you know, inside of two weeks. Um, and we knew we could get to, to a closing, you know, with the idea that, again, we'd be replacing it, so it's not, a, it's not a mechanism we're using for an extended period of time. Larry, you've used crowdfunding to raise higher amounts of money than the traditional, because William said prior to the show that his average crowdfunding is $90,000 per investor. The average check size. The average mm -hmm. project size, 40 to 50. Our average slug of whether it's equity or bridge financing is between 3 and $5 million. So Shorewood uh, is a real estate development company. I've partnered over the last three years with a group called Prodigy Network, which is a equity crowdfunding platform. To date, we've raised about $150 million of common equity in projects at cost of about $500 million here in Manhattan. And what we believe we're doing is providing um, investors, smaller investors, typically overseas, with the opportunity to invest in institutional quality assets with a very small denomination of money, maybe fifty to $100,000 to invest in a hundred to $150 million project. Didn't they say that they're, as opposed to the fifty to $100,000, they are normally a quarter of a million or half a million dollar investment? We have about 1,000 investors to date, and we've raised about $150 million. So if you blend it across, it's about 150. We have many investors who had invested between 500000 and a million dollars. Explain the changes in the law of the, uh, you know, which sure. took place a couple of years ago. So there's a thing called 506B, which we operate under, which has been around forever operates under Reg D, uh, under the rules of the SEC. It essentially means you do a private placement. So when we list a deal on a platform... How much is the person net worth, okay? So for a person under a private placement, yeah. don't they have to have a certain income? Sure. The, so you need to be what's called an accredited investor. That means your net worth, excluding your primary residence, is a million dollars or more, or there's an income verification too. $200,000 uh, previous two years. Uh, for an individual, joint is $300,000. But you don't have to verify that. Do they have to send you your tax return? Sure. So if you do a 506B offering, which is a private offering, you don't take a billboard out in Times Square saying invest my project, versus a general solicitation, 506C, 506B you do not have to verify that they're an accredited investor. And what you do is what's called check the box, which is what any other hedge fund or private equity firm does. Under general solicitation, if you take out a public offering, take out a, a billboard in Times Square, you have to verify that they're accredited. Uh, the easiest way to do that is by getting a letter from their lawyer or accountant. There are several third-party platforms using technology to make that a little bit more streamlined and efficient, but we're just not there yet. Do you do that also? Yes. And we also, uh, there's always concern when you raise foreign capital. Uh, we also do all of the KYC and AML protocols that major banks use to, to ensure that all the funds are coming in properly. We know that you you explained before why you use crowdfunding. It was efficient, quick, and timely, and it was able over there. You use EB-5s in certain major projects, okay? Tell us a little bit about why you use EB-5 financing, we as opposed to going to a crowdfunding source one or also going to, uh, you know, um, a preferred equity type of source. 
Well, uh, EB-5 for us fills a piece of the capital stack, so that may be layered in with uh, institutional capital, uh, high net worth individual capital, and traditional bank finance. And uh, we've utilized EB-5 on some of our development projects um, purely because of the cost of capital is attractive and also because of the term. It's a very long-term capital, and these development projects take time to both construct and sell out. People hear about the EB-5 as they see articles in the newspaper because last year there was legislation. People didn't know if the program was going to be renewed. It created like 10,000 visas last year, maybe 11,400 in that number. Uh, let's talk about some of your projects that you've used EB-5 financing. Nick, you'll talk about some of others, and Paul will talk about that, and we'll talk about some crowdfunding projects. Sure. Uh, we've utilized EB-5 on uh, three projects. Uh, a mixed-use uh, project here in on Bryan Park, uh, which consists of both uh, high-end condos as well as a hotel and retail component. Uh, total capitalization in the range of uh, 250 million. Uh, we're utilizing it on another project down on the Lower East Side, uh, a mixed-use project of hotel, uh, about 360 key hotel, and 11 residences. And uh, we're currently in the market uh, for another large mixed-use project. Uh, that will consist of uh, about 130 key hotel, residential, retail, uh, down on the High Line. And you, Paul? Um, we've utilized it for really a mix of property types, uh, assisted living, multifamily, hospitality. Uh, we've stepped out of real estate and done a animation studio. Uh, we're actually in the market with another one at the moment. Um, but the you know, very similar, the, the structure was really mezzanine, so it was in conjunction with other forms of capital. Nick, you've, uh, you've been the, uh, the, the granddaddy on this over there. You've done some major projects. We've done uh, a couple of projects for the Durst organization. That pyramid building on 57th Street, we have about $180 million in. That's a large multifamily residential rental. That's a rental. We also did 855 6th Avenue, which is retail and rental for the Durst family as well. We've done a few for uh, Bruce Ratner at Forest City, Atlantic Yards, which is also rental and condominium. We've been involved in 701 Times Square with Whitcoff, I-Star and Starwood, um, about $200 million in that hotel. And uh, we've got a, quite a few other ones that are out there now, but we've done about 19 projects so far, raised about $2.1 billion, and uh, that's where we stand today. So I, I heard John mention you know, the terms are better. He has a longer period of time. Is it longer than the period of time that, that he has on the first mortgage in many cases? In many cases it is, yes. In many cases we are five year, on a rental building we're a five year term with, with two two year extensions. We get them out to nine, 10 years. Now is it accruing the interest or is it paying the interest? Does, does he pay interest current? Or? It's all current pay. It's current pay and the pr principal is due at the end. That's correct. Tell us about some of the projects that you've done locally. Sure, we're just uh, announcing, well, not locally, I'll give you an example of one we're announcing today, which is a pretty good fit, an example of how EB-5 and crowdfunding can work together. Uh, sponsor was Egbert Perry, chairman of Fannie Mae, 108 unit Class A plus multifamily development in Sacramento, California. Uh, Deutsche Bank provided the senior construction loan, 33 million, $8 million EB-5 slug, uh, $3 million preferred equity slug uh, from crowdfunding. The terms on that were a fixed rate, high teens, uh, preferred equity investment, half paid, half accrued. So if I'm listening around, and you know, I, as everyone knows that the stock market did not have a stellar year last year, um, it seems that there would have been a higher return if I invested in a crowdfunding. Right, Larry and uh, William? Uh, we just finished a project on 46th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue uh, where we partnered with uh, a brand called AKA. They do luxury extended stay furnished units. Uh, bought the building with uh, institutional capital. Bank of America gave us a construction acquisition and renovation loan, some mezzanine financing from a pension fund, and about $20 million of crowdfunded capital. We completely renovated the building, put it back online and just refinanced out our debt and recapitalized out our crowdfunded investors and they earned about a 31% pre-tax IRR on those funds. So I'd say in that, that was specific a, deal, the answer would be yes. 
we feel we're a valuable alternative to the public markets. You have to understand that, uh, and I'll just give the REIT analysis as one. Uh, a lot of the REITs own long-term stabilized, say, triple net deals. Uh, these rents are being paid monthly by typically Fortune 500 companies. The underlying assets aren't depreciating if the stock market goes down. So there's a sort of inefficiency in the market uh, for the volatility component. Uh, in our crowdfunding deals, uh, you're buying direct investments with the underlying assets being real assets that are paying monthly. Uh, so we feel that you're more... You paying know, interest monthly pre principal at the end of the loan. Correct. Yes, sir. And we feel we're a much better, uh, more viable alternative. Uh, we're not susceptible to the volatility in the overall economy, specifically the st uh, stock market. These are long-term stabilized assets, typically. We were talking before the show, I think there was a terminology of what a, a crowdfunding investor is. What was the... the oh, the acronym that the I acronym. used. <laughs> uh, Henry, uh, a high earner, not rich yet. It's an individual who might have a net worth of two to five million dollars, um, and they want to invest a certain portion of their portfolio in real estate. However, they want the opportunity to select the asset and the project they put their money in, as opposed to buying a share in a REIT, where essentially it's a portfolio of assets that they don't but necessarily But isn't know. it true that a lot of people who went into crowd, some of the maybe the initial investors in crowdfunding? were people who invested $5,000, $10,000 in a project. And, you know, they went through, you know, they were under the Jobs Act. These were small investors. And, you know, there's a, today we have over 120 real estate crowdfunding companies. I mean, a year ago when I did a show, maybe we had 50. I mean, mm -hmm. how many uh, survival rates? Uh, I think there's going to be long-term, probably 5 to 10, that have their own little niche that control the market. Listen, I'm as uh, surprised as anybody else that the institutional players are already knocking on the door. I held the breakfast, moderated the breakfast last week at the Mortgage Banker Association. It was standing room only. The majority of the people in the audience were people from Blackstone, Carlisle, people trying to figure out what crowdfunding is and how we can work with it. Um, our average investment size in December 2014 was 15000 uh, Last month, or December 2015, was uh, 90000 So you're seeing the institutional players start to come in and write seven-figure checks. Here's my question. HFZ is a company like Silverstein and re the related companies who both created, not HFZ, could have. They created their own regional center. They raised money. They went to China. They went to South America. They went to other places, and they did these programs. Why did you not start the HFZ regional center as opposed to using NIC? We're in the development business. We want to focus on our projects. Um, you know, the EB-5 business or the crowdfunded business, they're, they're businesses. They, they require staff and people to focus and, and expertise. And, and, you know, for us, we found a great partner, Nick, and we want him to focus on raising that capital and, and us develop. Right, which is similar to what, you know, Nick was saying about Forest City Ratner. You know, Bruce Ratner and the Durst, they, they're both large organizations, huge organizations, who could do it themselves. But they said, I'll leave it to the professional in what they're saying. There's a lot of disclosure risk that goes along with uh, raising your own capital. <laughs> and, and in the last legislation that was proposed this year, um, SEC's gotten involved, <laughs> and there's gonna, it's going to be tougher for people to have their own regional center. There's, there's an inherent conflict of interest, right? So if, if you're raising money for yourself and you're investing it in your own project, who are you protecting in the event of a default? Your, your limited partners or your own equity? So it, it's just it's a struggle that really doesn't make sense, and for what you're going to save, it's not worth it. Now, here's the, the question. Who becomes a regional center? You're, you're operating, you're in the business of being a regional center. That's your main focus. You, you may be in development, but your main business is being a regional center. You, the majority, you're, you're into a variety of forms of raising equity. So the regional center is a complement to the private equity fund and to the other funds over there. Correct. Okay. As you were saying to me prior to the show, there are 750, 800 regional centers around the country. And what I noticed uh, when I did my research is that there are certain regional centers who are really, you know, in, in a way some, similar to what you were saying, but not to the established brands. They are little companies who could be looking to fund a hotel or fund a medical center. How does the government allow, you know, they don't have the, the legal capability, 
the uh, you know the expertise, the financial wherewithal. How does the government allow all these regional centers to be created? You know, it's it's funny. When I first started this in 2009, it was about 25 regional centers. That's it. So when you went to China or wherever you went to raise capital, you didn't run into any, anybody. There was really nothing going on. <clears throat> what happened was when, when, the, when the market crashed here financially, um, it really brought <clears throat> a spotlight on AB5, and people started to use it. Once we really got into it in New York with, you know, Durst and Fisher and Whitcoff and Forest City and, and, and these groups and HFZ, <clears throat> people started to notice it. Banks started to notice it. It was, I'll tell you, it was very difficult to get into creditors negotiated with, like, you know, HSBC, M&T, you know, Wells and, and, and these major banks. But, you know, what happened is it really evolved into a business, now you, into a real industry. So now USCIS and the SEC and the State Department are looking at more regulation on this business. So it's going to change. It's in the process of changing, and when that happens, uh, Mike, many people won't be able to comply <clears> with, <throat> with the reporting, with, with the due diligence that has to be performed to prove that you're actually meeting the exemptions that you enjoy under the laws and, and, and these type of things. So it, it got to be the Wild West, but the Wild West is going to come back to a real regulated... So industry. the marshals are coming into town. The marshals are here. <laughs> <laughs> Same with crowdfunding. We're seeing that, I think you would agree... You know, initially when we both started around the same time, there were, I don't know, five or six viable crowdfunding platforms. And now, as you say, it's gone up to 120. And there'll be some significant shakeout when a deal goes bad, there's negative publicity, which inevitably will happen given our cyclical business. So um, and but we'll think, still be here. <laughs> no, no, no. But I believe what you just said is very factual. It's a cyclical business, and we all remember 2008. We remember times that there are ups and downs in the business. How does a developer find you, crowdfunder, crowdfunder? How do you find him as a crowdfunder? It's a perfect example. And then I'm going to ask Sean how he found Nick or how Nick gets his business. Yeah, I mean, before I, before I say how I found William's company, um, you know, it's important to point out that of the regional centers that are out there, most of the regional centers have not done transactions. So USCIS has already started a process to weed out uh, centers that have not done business. Um, and many developers would set up a what they call a hypothetical filing, not even have a real project to be able to hold a USCIS designation as a regional center. So we'll see that natural weeding out that's, that's already happening. It'll continue. Um, I spoke at a, uh, an Urban Land Institute um, seminar here in New York um, and met one of uh, William's IT guys. Um, it was one of those where we wanted to know more about crowdfunding. He wanted to know more about EB-5 and some of the private equity things we were doing, and it, it, it grew from there. How do you find customers? Uh, or, or are you more of a captive on your crowdfunding Yeah, it, it's, more, it's more captive. Prodigy has been able to supply uh, common equity. They have uh, a website that they use. They've raised money in 22 countries and 19 states to date. Uh, they have a broad distribution network. And to William's point, now we have family offices and private wealth managers who are seeking out uh, these real estate opportunities that we offer for their clients. So that distribution network is growing. So we see a lot of deal flow, probably up to 500 deals a month, and I'm not going to lie to anybody, uh, the quality of the deals that come in unsolicited online aren't the best. Uh, how we've uh, been most successful finding working with the chairman of Fannie Mae is through our, our own existing network, reaching out to uh, investors, sponsors, uh, word of mouth and referrals are always the best uh, way to find solid deals for us. And you, how do you find... You know, we're, we're involved in the real estate community, so we, you know, we kind of see what's happening. You know, we've done deals with other banks, so we've developed a, a pretty good network. Um, you know, we'll, we'll approach people from time to time, but the majority of our business is referrals and repeat. Uh, so here, here's another question. The investor, as you said prior to the show, puts a half a million dollars traditionally in to get their green card over the period of time, correct? Correct. There's interest being paid to the investor on a crowdfunding, but you were saying to me that there's little or no interest paid to a immigrant who's trying to get a green card. Am I correct for both? Of you? It's little interest. You have to pay some interest, but it's it's little interest. It's they don't they're not investing for interest. They're investing for safe passage. They have their the husband, the wife, the children. You know their life is in your hands. 
when they invest in your in your project, your regional center, they trust that you're going to give them a solid way to get to the U.S. And that's important. And many are doing it because the investors we've we've encountered and dealt with because their children are being educated here, or they'd like to have their children educated here. So especially in China, that's a major motivator. Of the 11,400 visas given last year, how many of them were from Asia, China? Majority. And what other countries do we see the investors from? Uh, Korea, India, Mexico, South America, a little bit in Russia. Now, we were talking before, either you or Zio went to China to give a display or presentation on the project? Yes. So a seminar, um, we're in the midst of a, a raise for our project at 7611th. And uh, um, we went with Nick uh, and his team in Beijing and Shanghai to present to uh, a room of uh, prospective investors uh, a ro roadshow, educate them on the project, and, um, and you know, let Nick and his team take it from there. So he, he, here's the question. So I'm, I, I go to a, a roadshow for HFZ. I go a roadshow for Silverstein Properties. Do the same people go to these road shows? I mean, I don't want to say this. It goes back to you from Florida to the old situation that people would buy condominiums in Century Village and they would be getting their box. They'd have their lunch or their dinners, you know, going back in the in, in those days. They do. They do travel to different seminars to see what what's out there. But what they really trust is track record. So if you you know if, if you've done a lot of it, you know we ha we have over four thousand investors right now. In our company, it's it just it's just a solid, safe, you know, institution. And and in most cases, crowd uh, EB five is for construction. Most cases, crowdfunding. Uh, the majority of the stuff that we it's probably fifty fifty ground up development and buying some value add uh, type assets. We've done almost exclusively uh, adaptive reuse of existing buildings, no ground up. So. In conclusion, crowdfunding and EB-5 seems to be here to stay. It's truly evolved over, as you said, 1990. It started, nobody really knew. It was 2009 that the world changed, you know, because it was difficult to get the banks in there. And the banks have kept down their loans, to, let's say, between 50 to 65 percent, and the world is better. It's also been able to... You know, as people are looking, it's an alter on crowdfunding, other things. It's a good way to give a different alternative investment opportunity. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely an evolution, and I'd like to thank everyone for being here. Nick, Paul, John, S. Lawrence Davis, <laughs> and William, and I'll see you next week.